But hey, you guys know we're in a series. The name of the series is I Promise. Today we're talking about I Promise to Be Free. But first of all, before we get into that, I want to introduce a lady here on stage this morning. Her name is Sabrina Crawford. Give her a round of applause. And Sabrina, tell us a little bit about your ministry, if you will. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, Gigi's House is a ministry that was started a couple of years ago, and it houses and serves girls that are victims of sex trafficking. Um, we serve girls ages 13 to 19, although we have had a 12-year-old. Um, they come to Gigi's House, and they live there. Um, we offer trauma-informed therapy and homeschool to girls, but above all else, it's faith-based, and we tell them all about Jesus and teach them that they're loved and their self-worth and just meet them where they are. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I appreciate that. appreciate you being here and being willing to come talk with us this morning, and, and I would also challenge every one of us here. Um, that's a ministry that is certainly something you can get involved with and uh, give to to help support that ministry and the incredible work that you're doing, which is absolutely, give her a round of applause, let her know how much you appreciate it. Uh, uh, but uh, the name of the, the, the sermon this morning is, I Promise to Set You Free. And you guys know that in this period of the year, freedom is kind of on our minds in a very big way. Uh, we just uh, uh, celebrate Memorial Day, and you guys know Memorial Day, and probably uh, some of you know somebody who has served and perhaps even given up their life so that we could be free. Uh, D-Day just happened, uh, uh, and that certainly is where, where the, the, uh, they stormed the beaches there of Normandy, and men, women willing to give up their lives uh, so that we can have that freedom. Uh, this week, in fact, uh, uh, is Juneteenth, and, and that's when we uh, realize or celebrate the fact that slavery finally ended here in the United States. And then, of course, July 4th is just around the corner, and a lot of you are already planning hot dogs or hamburgers, getting ready to, to celebrate the freedom of this country, uh, the nation's birthday. And so freedom is certainly something that is that is on our mind right now, and, and probably all of us here would say we live in the country that has the greatest amount of freedom, and we celebrate that, and we love that, and we enjoy those freedoms very, very much. But I want to ask this morning, are you truly free? And when I say truly free, I'm taking that from the words of Jesus right here in John 8, verse 36. It says this, so if the Son sets you free, then you are truly free. And some of your translations might say, free indeed. Are you really free? What is Jesus getting at here? And that really needs to be the question that, that gets to us this morning as to whether or not we are truly free in that sense of the world. Do we have that real freedom that Jesus is talking about? I'd like us to go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Father, thank you so very much that you are a God who has come close to us through your son, Jesus Christ. You gave a gift, the greatest gift of all. And it's through that gift, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that we find true freedom, real freedom. Father, I ask this morning that you will speak to those who are, through those who are here on stage that your message will be clear, your spirit will move inside of us. Father, you will point out those areas that need to be worked on, those areas that are not pleasing to you, and that you indeed will have your way with each and every one of us. Father, let us walk out of here this morning knowing that true freedom, that true freedom that we can only have in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much, Father, for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's talk about it this morning, guys. Um, here we have John 8, 36, and Jesus says, hey, here's the deal. It's not unless the sun sets you free that you will truly be free indeed. We've celebrated a lot of the freedom that we have here in this country. But what we're talking about now, and we're going to this passage of Scripture, and I believe God just really laid this Scripture on my heart this week. And uh, it's found in Luke chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip there. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And in this, we have a story. 
And the story, if you, if you were to read this story and uh, um, describe it, in fact, probably in your Bible, it's titled something like the, the demoniac healed by Jesus, the man who had demons and he's healed by Jesus. And that's the title of the story. And that would be accurate. And if I asked uh, probably most of you here, describe that story in one sentence, you would say, oh, that's a story about where a man had a lot of demons and Jesus came and he healed him when nothing else would work. And you'd be right but I would like to say there, there is another title to this story that I think is, is, is even more on point and more on point for us here today. Yeah, the story is about a man that is healed by Jesus who had all these demons. But I would also suggest that this story, and, and, and maybe better, would be described as the town, the entire town of people who didn't see their need for Jesus and so they asked him to leave. Because that really gets to the point of what's going on right here and where we, in fact, can be in society. Where we, even our town here, even our city, even our state, even in our country, uh, could, it be, could it be that we, in the same way, not realizing it, but really in the same way, have invited Jesus out of our country, have asked him to leave, just like these people did right here. And so we see, we, we can look around and go, yeah, this person needs Jesus, man. He's got a lot of demons, and boy, does that person need Jesus. But maybe, just maybe, that this message here is for us to look and say, wait a second, this town needs Jesus. This city needs Jesus. We need Jesus. And sadly, could it be that we've asked him to leave? I think that's probably our biggest problem that we're facing. But that being the case... Uh, that lends itself to all the other problems that we're facing here today. All the other things that are going on that we can look at and we go, wow, that's a big problem and that's a big problem. Uh, help me out. What are some of these big problems that we have right here in our town? Some of these big problems that we have right here in our country. Let's go ahead and call them out. Let's say, let's say what they are. It is. It is. James. Uh, yeah, and just last night I was watching a movie where they went to Wendy's, or three miles from my house, and Joel was playing the drums, and he's doing protests, and there's right reasons to be mad and yet you know we're also burning down a Wendy's and and there's you know there's so much hurt that's out there and it just sometimes looks like uh, an impossible problem to fix I don't like I'm watching this and I'm saddened by it and I don't have any idea what to do about this this Wendy's burning down and and, and that's of course just one example but it's that kind of thing is happening all over our country where there's yes. just hurt and anger that's coming out and and you want to you want to help, but it's you feel helpless. Yes, yes. That's right. What else? Meanwhile, we still have uh, a lot of problems that that aren't in the spotlight right now, like uh, people struggling with addiction. Yes. Um, Sabrina will talk about the sex trade industry, um, and and just a lot of other things that are eating away at individuals and our society. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And I think that when I look at our girls, we've served 61 since we've opened. And when you look from the outside thinking you're going to, um, set, they're going to be set free. They come to you and then they run. And, and that was a shock for me in the beginning. Like I couldn't quite understand it. Here's this beautiful home we're giving you to, to put your head at night. But what I had to learn real quick is how much of that we hold inside of us, how much of that anger that was inside, how much of the shame was inside. And it was so much easier to run or bust out a building or torch a car, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
that's what they were either taught or felt. And that's how they were getting that anger out. And so when they came to us and we were thinking, oh, we get to witness them being free and they're no longer on the streets. And these girls were getting raped 12, 15 times a night. So how wonderful it is that they get to come into our home and be loved and hear about Jesus. But they come there and they're full of so much shame and so much anger and so much childhood trauma. And so they either would do what we're seeing protesters are doing right now, or rioters do. Not, I'm not going to say protesters. That I'm, I'm really referring more to rioting. Is that they were getting that anger out when they bust up our walls or they tear down a door? They were getting that anger out, and I couldn't understand that at first when we first got there, or they first got there. And as we've shown them self worth, and as we've shown them true love, and how they didn't have to sell their body to get attention from somebody or to feel that love, we started really seeing the transformation take place. But on the outside, we were thinking they were free. Mm -hmm. We were thinking, oh, they're not on the street anymore. They're free, but they weren't free because the shame and the hate and the anger. And we've heard them say, God, let this happen to me. Or man, somebody I trusted, my family, my mom, my grandmother, let this happen to me. And so that anger manifests. And when this, the rioting first started happening, one of the things I said on social media is we got to teach our kids a different way to deal with this anger because rioting or punching holes in the wall or torching cars, that's not how to do it. But that's the only way they knew. So I understood it. I understood why people were doing it because I've watched 60, 60 plus girls in some way let all those years of anger just come out. You know, like they're just. And what you're saying is, is one sin leads to another sin, leads to another sin, and another sin. And you would even think, I think, Sabrina, uh, in all your research with the sex slave trade and what's been going on there, uh, say that in the United States we have a problem with pornography. That is correct. That lends itself to that as well. In the United States we have a problem with greed that lends itself with, to that as well. Uh, in the United States, in our town, we have a problem with self-centeredness, and it, it's all about me, and I don't care about you. And we can go on and on and on with all of these problems, these big problems, that, that we see here in the United States, but, but I think you've probably seen this as well, is, is it, it's so much easier if we can go sweep it under the rug and not think about it and say, not my problem. Right. And all of these issues are something that we can say, if I just don't have to think about it, if I can ignore it, if I can say it's at least just not in my house, um, if, if I can forget about it. And that's, that's the attitude that we even find right here in this story where here's a group of people who say, yeah, we know our problem, and the problem is this guy who's running around in the graveyard. He's our problem. Jesus fixed that problem. But by the way, get out after that because we don't have any problems otherwise. And that is a, that is a, a, a dangerous, dangerous place for us to be. James, you're on the seat of your, uh, your even the, uh Yeah, I was just going to say, even, even the rioting, I'm, I'm going to get this quote wrong. But, but Martin Luther King said something along the lines of, you know, rioting is the language of the unheard. And, and even the rioting is a symptom of these people not being heard. And so part of that, you know, yeah, we could say that I, I wish they were expressing themselves in a different way. But also, I wish we could make sure that they knew that we were listening and they didn't have to do that to get our attention. You know, that, you know, we can, we can wish that they would do other things, but you can't deny the fact that all these riots have brought attention to things that we've been ignoring. And so there's the other side of that is we need to make sure that we're listening before the Wendy's are on fire and, and all that stuff. It, it's, it's also a symptom of our, of our community mm -hmm. that people feel that they need to do that in order to be heard. And like you said, a symptom. All these are symptoms of our biggest problem, and our biggest problem is the God problem. Amen. We don't want God to be in our life. And so over and over, we have asked him to leave. And like Jesus does here, when he's asked to leave, he can step out. He can step out. I want us to look at that now and look at how it plays out, especially and notice that, that the one who ends up getting the freedom in this and the people who end up not getting the freedom that Jesus promises. In Luke chapter 8, verse 26, and it's a long story, but let's read it uh, together anyway. Uh, they sailed on to the country 
of the Gerasenes, directly opposite Galilee. As he stepped out onto land, a madman from town met him. He was a victim of demons. He hadn't worn clothes for a long time, nor lived at home. He lived in the cemetery. And when, when he saw Jesus, he screamed and fell before him and bellowed, What business do you have messing with me? You're Jesus, son of the high God, but don't give me a hard time. And the man said this because Jesus started to order the unclean spirit out of him. Time after time, the demon threw the man into convulsions. He had been placed under constant guard and tied with chains and shackles, but crazed and driven wild by the demon, he would shatter the bonds. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Mob. Uh, Your Bible might read, read legion. He says, mob or legion, my name is mob, he said, because many demons afflicted him. And they begged Jesus desperately not to order them to the bottomless pit. A large herd of pigs was browsing and rooting on a nearby hill, and the demons begged Jesus to order them into the pigs, and he gave the order. It was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff into the lake and drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in town and country. People went out to see what happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had been sent sitting there at Jesus' feet, wearing decent clothes and making sense. It was a holy moment. And for a short time, they were, they were more reverent than curious. Then those who had seen it happen told, the demoniac, uh, told how the demoniac had been saved. Later, a great many people from the Gerasene countryside got together and asked Jesus to leave. Too much change, too fast, they were scared. So Jesus got back in the boat and set off. The man whom he had delivered from the demons asked to go with him, but he sent him back saying, now you go home and tell everything God did in you. So we went back and preached all over town everything Jesus had done in him. Wow, what a story, huh? What a story. It's one of those you can certainly almost picture what's going on right here. And you, can't, you can almost imagine this man who is crazed, this man who's, who's just out of his mind. I mean, even to the point he's breaking chains and, and uh, cutting himself, the Bible says, and, and they can't get this under control. That's the problem in the town right there. They've got, they, they need somebody to help them out, and here comes Jesus. And Jesus does just that. Jesus heals this man. But what do you see in all this? And I've, I jotted down just this week four lessons that need to be learned that I need to get, and maybe, and maybe you'll jot them down as well. But I want us to talk about each of these. And uh, Serena, you already hit a little bit on one of these, talking about the girls here. But this is what I call four lessons to be learned. And the first one I want us to talk about this morning, number one, is I can be free on the outside but still chained on the inside. Uh, isn't that interesting? Here's this picture of this guy, and he breaks the chains. He's as free as can be. You know, he's doing whatever he wants uh, right there in the, in the graveyard, but, but you realize there's something going on inside of him. He's bound by these demons. These demons have a hold on him, and, uh, and, and it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Maybe we dress it up better than he did. Uh, maybe we can, we can look the part and we can, we can act the part. We can look like we've got ourselves all together. But I wonder how many of us still have something inside of us that we think we have a hold on, but it really has a hold on us. It, what, what are those things? Um, let, let's talk about them. Do you have anything? And, and even looking back over this last week uh, to, to be able to say, you know what? Uh, this is something that maybe once I'd surrendered to Jesus, but I went and I picked it back up and I still got it. And I think I'm handling it, but it's handling me. Glenn, you got something like that? Yeah, I got plenty of them, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that, I, I just love this concept um, that you're pointing out here. I can be free on the outside, but still chained on the inside. And some of our sins and the things that bring us down are more obvious. Maybe it is an addiction or, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're living a life of crime and and uh, it can be seen, but oftentimes on the inside, there are things that we're dealing with. Um, you know, I may not be have spent time in prison, but uh, you know, I, I, I have still have to deal with my pride. I still have to deal with uh, anger. I still have to deal with uh, um, with anxiety that gets out of control sometimes. So I definitely deal with a lot of things that people may not really see. That that it's still I'm still chained on the inside. 
Yeah, it affects you each week. It affects how you feel. It affects your day. It affects how you think about things. Very good. What else? That hit me this week is mom guilt. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are grown, and so I think, oh, everything's fine, but every once in a while it comes back up. But it's those kinds of things sometimes I think that we justify because, I mean, it's good, right? I'm worrying about my kids. That's good, right? But it's not because they belong to him. They don't belong to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think mom gets a big one, a big one. And a lot of people deal with that. And, and, uh, and even guilt in general, guilt in general. Guilt is a, certainly a, one of those things that can have us chained and continue. Uh, anytime he wants to, to work us over, Satan can kind of uh, pull that chain and, and say, oh, don't you remember when you did this? And don't you remember this about you? And remember all this, even though we know that Jesus has set us free from those things. Good. What else? In, in doing my research for Gigi's house, or really trying to understand the problem and why it even exists, why are men and women selling our kids, or why is prostitution still around and affecting our kids at such a young age? Um, what you alluded to earlier just kept on coming up, whether it was a therapist I was talking to or somebody I was trying to um, figure out, like what was the root problem, and porn addiction is so prevalent in our country, our county, our state. And it's affecting kids younger and younger. The internet and computers, it is so easy. And in, in all of the research, what, what I found or saw was there was a, an underlying problem there. They were looking for something and that filled that void. It was something was empty, something inside. They didn't have Jesus in their heart. They didn't, they were struggling with um, shame or childhood trauma was a lot. A lot of that was childhood trauma. And so looking on the outside, they looked, as Glenn said, they looked good. They looked free. They looked like they had their life together, but deep down inside, they were really struggling with childhood trauma, guilt, anger, something they never um, got help with, something that they never allowed Jesus to get in their heart and replace. And so they were out looking for something to fill that void. And porn addiction has been a lot of what has fueled going from porn addiction to sex addiction and, you know, it's ruined good men with good families and good jobs. It's ruined their life because they really allowed that porn addiction and sex addiction to take over. That's right. That's right. And it does. It comes from that emptiness and trying to fill that emptiness with, with something. Yeah. I, I just think, too, Bo, that like this number one, it says um, you can be free on the outside um, or you assume you're free. Um, and I just think about, like, uh, I use it a lot because it was me. I, I always speak for me first, is that you'd pull in this parking lot or any church parking lot, and then you'd put that church mask on. Yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. I got my mask on. I'm good. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, man. Everything's great. You know, and, and, and all along, when you put that mask on, when you leave your car, you don't realize that Satan's still in the car when you leave. So he's waiting on you to come back, and as soon as you take that mask off, you're back to your struggles. Uh, you know, I, I struggle <clears throat> with a father wound that I didn't even know I had until I started attending Celebrate Recovery, and I was asked just to lead worship. I didn't even know what it was. I was like, this, maybe they're celebrating Jesus every Thursday. I don't know what this is. <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized as I sat there that I had a father wound, um, which affected my communication with my wife Anytime there were financial issues, and the reason why was because um, my two older brothers were already moved out, and so uh, there would always be fights with my parents, which was usually about money. Uh, and I watched my mom, who was a very small lady, uh, and my dad was about 250 pounds, and I would watch him verbally and physically abuse my mother. And I was the only one there to witness that. And then it hit me there one Thursday, and I said, okay, I see what it is. My struggle is, um, my chain was that I felt like, even though I, I never get mad, I'm like, my wife always says I have the patience of Job, but in my mind, Satan would tell me, don't bring up the finances, because it could lead to what you saw as a kid. Um, and so I would never bring it up, and so it was an issue um, for so long. Um, and so I was chained up inside, for many years, even up here, I mean, I just say, guys, that we're up here, but we struggle, too. We're not on this platform and 
because you sing a song, you're perfect. Golly, Lord, I'm a long way from, from perfect. Um, but Christ is in my life every day, and I, I'm just glad that I can go to him daily about my issues. But it was a struggle, and I finally got out of that mask issue before I came in and just realized that I've got chains. i got to go to Jesus every day and ask to be saved from these issues that I have. And um, I think that's just us as, a, as just a, a country, a community, that we all have issues that we're afraid to talk about, especially men. You know, we don't want to share that. And uh, that's just the mentality of a man that I got it together. And Lord have mercy, I thought I had it together for a long time, and I didn't realize I didn't. So, yeah. Oh, that's good, Mario. Really good. And isn't it interesting that Jesus calls the demon says, what's your name? You know, let's, let's, let's say the names of these things. Let's say the names of these things that are haunting us. And, and there's power in calling them out and pointing to them and, be, and, and saying, you know, I didn't think, but this is it. This is it. And, and when he does that, then he can start, you can say, all right, here it is. Here's this demon, Lord, you can deal with this. You can handle this. And I think that's so awesome. Any others on this? That I was just going to say, I feel like sometimes those things that you struggle with are the things that Christ can use the most in your life. You can, if you're honest, then you can reach others because then you say it and somebody says, oh my gosh, me I'm too. not by myself. It's not just exactly. me. Exactly, me too. We, uh, Kim and I were walking this uh, last week through our neighborhood and, and we passed this man and waved at him and, and we came, came back and passed him again and, and he stopped us and wanted to talk to us and uh, was asking us how far we walked and so we just got into a little conversation and uh, talked about kids and he said he had grandkids and Kim was like, what? Uh, because I would have said, uh, he said he had grown grandkids and I would have said he's my age and come to find out he's like 20 years older than me. And we were like, how do you look so good? <laughs> and, uh, and so his name's William, and I, 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 I call him Wise William now. Um, uh, but he told us that he'd served in Vietnam and, and so forth. He's been retired for a good while now. And, uh, but as good as he looks, and he goes, he goes it's because I don't, I don't uh, uh, listen to the what-ifs of life. And when he, when he said that, he, it just hit me because last week for me was a week of what ifs. And how many different things are we going, what if this happens and what if this happens? It's another way where we just worry about everything in life. And, and in this world that we're living in right now, we can play out the what ifs and it can drive us as mad as this guy right here. Uh, but playing out the what ifs is, is, is uh, it was best put that worry is imagining the future without God in it. And we have to look and see, wait a second now, I can't live the what ifs. And worry is another one of those, those very demons that can destroy us. I think God sent William because we were steps from discussing a what if. <laughs> yeah. Like, what if this happens? What, you know, how yeah. will we handle this? What will we do? And then... It was like just seconds later, William, there he is. Yeah. We're probably going to find out William was really an angel, and uh, <laughs> that's why he looked as good as he did, all right? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> good deal. So uh, any others real quick? Uh, yeah, Pete? And, and just one thing, uh, Pastor Bo. Um, I believe that the way the church goes is the way that the world goes. And... I, you know, I no longer just want to be called a Christian. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I don't want to just be superficial anymore. I don't want to just be that guy that's coming to church, going to the coffee bar, getting my hazelnut coffee, and getting upset because there's no hazelnut out there. And it's just... <laughs> Not this way. My name is Pete, and I struggle with hazelnut. But the thing is, I hear grown-up Christians that's been saved for years now saying that they hate somebody because of political persuasion. They've got unforgiveness, or we've got unforgiveness, and they're okay with it. So when the world sees the church holding on to hate and unforgiveness, um, the Bible tells us in Matthew 6, uh, Jesus says that we ask God for forgiveness, and we've got to forgive men their trespasses. And if we don't, God is not going to forgive us. And, and when... The, a lot of times Christians are not reading their Bibles anymore. 
we're just listening to the news, we listen to CNN, we listen to Fox, and we have no Bible in us. And it's, and it's shown because we can't take a punch. It's like what we call virtual Christianity. You know, we, we, we look like saints, we walk like saints, we got our little Bible and all that. But when the rubber meets the road, when I see a, supposedly a white person do something to a black person, all of a sudden, I can't pray for that person because I hate them because they got their foot on my neck. And are you kidding me? My Savior was on the cross forgiving folk, saying, yeah. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So listen, I don't want to be this superficial, weak knee, jelly back, milk toast Christian. Mm -hmm. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I want to lead other folk into that. And, and if you're a saint and you're getting around me and you hate this, and stop. Stop, because let me tell you this, the devil has a foothold on you. Matter of fact, C Cain could have been rescued because God says, look, you've got anger crouching at your door. And then later on, he goes out and kills his brother. And then when God asks him, where's your brother? He smarts off to God. You know, am I my brother's keeper? So we don't want the spirit of Cain. We want the spirit of Jesus Christ. Or we want the spirit of Stephen that while he was getting stoned, Stephen was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yes, unrest is going on. Yes, trials and tribulations are going on. But your saints are the most high God. We Amen. win. God is on the inside of us. And greater is he that's on the inside than he that's on the outside. Again, I want to be a spiritual thermostat. I Amen. want to set the conditions. I don't want to be a thermometer because all I can do is just react. Amen? Amen. So, Amen. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's church. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Kim just said we're done. That's it. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. Awesome. Let's talk about number two. <laughs> no person is too far gone for Jesus. And we see that with this young man right here, that Jesus did save him which means if he can save him, then he can save him and him and him and him and her and me. And there's no person that is too far gone for Jesus. Have you guys ever thought that? Have you ever looked at somebody else and written them off? Have you ever looked at, looked at somebody and said, eh, you know what, God can fix everybody, but I, I, we can't even deal with you. And I think we see a lot of that going on even in, the church today, like you said, Pete. But the truth is, no person is too far gone for Jesus. I have, I'm, I'm so glad that this point is in here today because I have several people that I've literally been praying for, uh, you know, for I guess 35 years or more. And I, they're still in my life, they're still friends. They're people that I've had many intense conversations about Jesus with them and uh, good people living decent lives by the world's standards but uh, they don't have faith in Christ and uh, there's some times where I think man uh, could that really happen could they really become Christians are they just too far gone and uh, I'm glad that no person is too far gone and I'm continuing to pray for for those folks um, another thing I want to say about this is just some of what we're doing right here. I think we can realize um, that no person is too far gone when we share what each other is going through and we hear like, okay, well, if Mario's going through that, then maybe I'm not too far gone because I go through something too, you know? And so it's healthy to, to have these kinds of conversations and be vulnerable and share what's happening in our lives. Very good. And Glenn, you bring up the point that we must persist in our prayer for those who don't know Jesus at this point, uh, instead of writing them off. We must persist in that, which is very, Steve, you had something right there. I thought Neil was oh, I'm off. sorry, Neil. Yeah, okay. I wrote this down when I was studying for it. I wrote, uh, Satan's business is to enslave and destroy, but Jesus's business is to set free and restore. Mm -hmm. And because it is his business to set free and restore, he has the desire to always restore. Though. So there is no one that is too far gone because it is his desire, greatest desire, that we will be set free and restored from those mm -hmm. things. 
Yeah, that's a great truth that we need to remember. Steve, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, Jesus knows everything, and he knew that maniac, demon-possessed man over yeah. there. And in the book of Luke, right before this, was the story of him coming through the storm. Yeah. And he came through a storm to get to that man. Yeah, and that's awesome. he will go through anything to get to us. We're not too far gone. And that man was too far gone. And society, you know, you talk about our country and what we have to offer. Society couldn't fix the guy. Mm. You know, they, they put a guard around him. They put chains on him. They put him out there in the cemetery. They didn't know what to do with him. But Jesus saw the dignity in the man, even mm. though he was possessed by demons, and loved him yeah. and, and called him a, a person, you know. And, and even though he was so messed up, Jesus wanted to restore him, like Neil was saying. And, and you bring a great point there, Steve. Uh, society couldn't fix them. And how many people is society saying, you need to be fixed and we need to do this to fix you and fix you and fix you. But we know who really fixes people, heals people. And, yeah. and, you know, not only is no person too far gone, but no community is too far gone. You know, we, that's part of this story is that it was the community that even had the bigger problem that they didn't recognize. And, and, of course, we know at the end of the story, Jesus sends the demoniac back to the community and says, no, they're not too far gone either. Go back there and, yeah. and you know, have an impact on them. And that was, you know, that's been my feeling lately is looking at our own community and feeling like, you know, can this even be fixed? And, and the answer is yes, but only if Jesus fixes it. And, and so we have to watch what Jesus is doing in our own community and, and get involved in what Jesus is doing, believing that our community can still be saved too. Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. Oh, and I love how in this story and the one before with Jesus in the boat, he really kind of proves that he has all authority. Number one, over all, all the physical, he can calm the waves and the, way, and the storm and the wind. But he, in the second story that we just read, he also proves that he has all authority over the demonic. All, all, and so th there's no place that we can put ourselves or find ourselves that he doesn't have authority, that he cannot come and he cannot move and restore us. Exactly right. And that's, the, that's what we can rejoice in, the truth right there. And it's, isn't it ironic, though, the only people that don't are the people who continue to say, get out of my town, get out of my town, that they don't give themselves that chance because they're saying, ask him to leave. There's no place except for him saying, you know what, if you don't want me here, I won't intrude. And, uh, and so that's what happens. And it brings us really to this third one right here. Um, I wanted to point out, my pigs can keep me from finding my freedom in Christ. My pigs can keep me from finding my freedom. And, and it's so interesting. These people, yeah, they got their problem fixed. But now we've got my pigs, man. And I don't have my pigs anymore. I really wanted my pigs. And a lot of us, we don't realize it, but I think we, we get to that place in our life where our pigs are so valuable. They're more valuable than that freedom that Jesus Christ gives us. And what pigs might there be in our life that we're holding on to saying, I got to have this, I got to have this, I got to have this. And the whole time he's saying, no, nah, won't you let that go? That's not that important. Can you let that go? Can you, can you give that up? Uh, let's talk about the pigs here for a second. Uh, any pigs? Well, you know, in this community, the pigs represented uh, their livelihood, their finances, uh, money. So oftentimes, I think we're tempted to, uh, to take money over people or to think money is more valuable than, than people or reaching people. Very good, Clint. Yeah, this story has always bothered me because of the pigs, because of, you know, whoever owns those pigs, they didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, and I always just would, would hear this story and think, but why did Jesus do that? Why would he destroy this person's property and their, their wealth? And, and in light of our current circumstances, I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking, you know, I think maybe the reason Jesus did it was to point out how people were valuing their things over the person, and that if you're valuing your things over the, the person, then, you know, then your priorities are wrong. Yeah. And so I think that really, really was a new way of seeing this passage to me that I've never seen it before, that, you know, we need to care more about people than we care about any things, mm -hmm. even our own things. Yeah, very good. I think sometimes the things we think we have a right to are pigs, like we, we think we have a right to be angry. You know, so we hold on to it, and I think that oftentimes prevents us from moving forward. Yeah, such a good point. 
a right. It's my right. I own this. Mm-hmm. Pig. I think, okay. uh, I'm sorry, Kim. Go ahead. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think our comfort, like, you know, like I, I, mm. I prefer to be comfortable. I'm not comfortable right now, guys, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but I want to show love, and I feel like I'm being obedient to Christ, and so I feel like I'm kind of trying to <laughs> give out, give, a, give up my comfort because. Yeah. You guys, I, I don't know if we've shared this before, but Kim absolutely does not want to be on stage. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, has, uh, it took a pandemic to get Kim on stage. <laughs> That's why this microphone is in front of me, trying to hide. <laughs> and and uh, so she's being very, very open and honest here. Comfort is one of those things. We like our comfort zones, don't we? We like to stay in our comfort zones. And when, when things are crazy, we're going, ooh, I'm not as comfortable now. And But he doesn't call us to stay in our comfort zones, does he? No, and that could be a pig for sure that, uh, that needs to be uh, barbecued. Yeah. <laughs> Good. What else? Any others? I just think, um, you know, one of the pigs is what we're dealing with right now. Um, is just we have to get involved. We have to talk uh, about what's going on. Um, it's, it's, it's a big deal. Obviously, we know that. Everybody's got an opinion on what's happening. Um, but then I think about my great-grandfather dealt with what's what was happening now, my grandfather, my father, myself and my brothers, now my son. So at some point, it's got to stop. And so as we sang this morning, we all want the favor of God for your family and, and their children, their children, their children. And that's such a powerful, those lyrics are so powerful. But... If we don't get involved, we have to start talking. We have to have conversations. We can't choose a side. I don't know any president that's walked the Calvary for us. Um, (laughs) No politician. It's all Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be Jesus. And now is not the time to sit on our hands and ignore it or have opinions uh, that are wrong. I mean, I was like, Neil, I had to finally get off social media because I was about to really explode with some of the <laughs> the racism's in the comments. It's not in the post. You probably figure that out. Um, but for me, um, and one of my pigs was I spoke about the gentleman that sat here for years in this audience while I was up leading worship, and I'm looking at him knowing that this is the guy and his brother that said the N-word every morning as we waited on the bus. And I had to, that chain was on the inside for a long time, and I just glanced at him, whew, I just, it was tough. Um, But I, I, what I'll say about this church is, I think it's the cookie cutter, even though we've been here right at 20 years, and this was the first place that was welcoming to a biracial couple um we go back and we talk about being free on the inside i think a lot of churches think they are free free on the outside but they're chained on the inside because it doesn't look like this on the inside uh and a lot of churches are now trying are are becoming multiracial. um but i tell people all the time this is the first one that i know that looked like heaven um so you got it right for me, there's no perfect church. They, and people can always have a comment, well, I don't have this, or oh, I'm not being fed, or oh, they don't have this, I don't like the music, or whatever. But right here, what's right is the Jesus part. Yeah. The greatest commandment was love, and this place has it. And that's critical, and that's important, especially right now. So what we're talking about now is, okay, now what do we do? We've talked about it here. Now we gotta move out of the walls and then we got to get it to the community and that's going to happen. Um, but this place does that and you got to have love and that's the most important part. And so that's not a pig that this place struggles with. Yeah. That's a, that's a, all these pigs, I think go back 
uh, to the really big pig, uh, the pig called Pride. Yeah. And uh, Mario, when you mentioned the, the, uh, the, the priestly blessing that we just sang, uh, I was thinking the same as we're singing it. And we want that God bless us and shine his face on us and give us peace and, and pour his grace out on us. And so we, we love that song and that prayer. But you cannot ask him to bless you if you have asked him to leave your town. And these folks, these folks said, get out of our town. We don't want you here. And that comes from a position of pride. But in order to receive the priestly blessing, you have to put yourself in a place of humility. Humility before the Lord. And then comes the blessing. Then comes the peace. Then comes the mercy and the grace that's poured out on our lives. And so, yes, that's, that's where we have to be. And that's the first thing when you said we got to start doing that we have to do. We have to be at that place of humility before our God and ask for that blessing then. Um, number four, the last part of this, those set free have a mission to set others free. And you're exactly right. We can't talk about it here, but we gotta go and do it. Um, the only hope, now isn't it ironic that, that the man who had no hope in the very beginning became the only hope now for this town? They asked, they asked Jesus to leave, and so Jesus says, all right, well, here's your only hope. Because every other time somebody says, Jesus, I want to follow you. Come and follow me. Come and follow me. But here he says, no, nah, you need to go back to that town. You need to go back to that town and tell them about the freedom, the real freedom that you have found because of me. And so we have now that mission to set others free. And we said it, uh, we've been saying it time and time again, this church, we are here for a reason. We're here for a purpose. May God use us to be those who are a light to this world, who should share the freedom with the rest of this town, with the rest of this state and country. He's put us here for a reason right now, but we've got to share the good news with others. I agree, and I think it's interesting just what you said, that Jesus left, but he still didn't leave the town with no hope because he healed that guy and left that guy there. And I think many of us feel like we may be the only guy, maybe may, may the only lady in the office or in our home or in our family. We're the only one there, and it feels like Jesus has left, but Jesus left us there to give hope and to share that message of healing and restoration and salvation with those people right there, just Amen. like you did there at this place. Amen. And we have that freedom. We have that freedom. Um, I'm going to finish up real quick, and uh, I know we got to get out of here, but one of my favorite things that ever happened in my life was uh, the day I got a phone call um, from my wife, and she said, I just got a speeding ticket. And uh, because I had always gotten them and she had never got one. And what made it worse was she said, um, the ticket says that I got to show up in court. And uh, she goes, she asked me, she said, would you, uh, will you go with me when I got to show up in court? And I'm like, I would not miss that for the world, man. <laughs> And uh, I remember court day. I remember court day. They, they, had, uh, they had her and all the other um, uh, criminals lined up. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there in court, and they marched them all in. And her being Adams had to go first, and, and she has to walk up and stand in front of this judge, and the podium is shaking <laughs> like this, and I'm just dying laughing back there. But you, you never tell the whole story. That's the whole story. No. <laughs> I had to go to court because I didn't have my insurance card. Was that what Not it was? because I did get a speeding ticket, yes. But you're making it sound like I was going way too fast and I had to go to court. Everybody's got an excuse, right? <laughs> Let me tell this story, okay? <laughs> now, but 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 she stood in front of the judge, and the judge uh, asked her, he said, Miss Adams, do you plead uh, guilty or not guilty? And she barely got the word out, but she said, guilty. And the judge did something amazing. He said, well, Miss Adams, I see that you haven't had anything else on your record here. Miss Adams, you are free to go. Amen. <laughs> and that's when I said, I object, Your Honor. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But... But man, she got, 
she got set free and she walked out of there and she was, but, but it was those words, the judge, you are free to go. And that changed everything. That changes everything. What so many of us don't realize is the judgments all already been made because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, he looks at you who are found in Christ, who have been washed by the blood, and he says, you are free to go. But in that freedom to go, now go and tell others how they can be free. We're free with a purpose. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes this morning in talking about this freedom Here today, first and foremost, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that you know before God Almighty, because of what Christ has done, he says to you, you are free, free, free to go. Friend, if you haven't, call out to him right now. Say, Jesus, right here, right now, the best son of hell, I want to receive you as my Savior. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my God and my Savior and my friend. Friend, when you pray that and you mean it with your heart, the Bible says you can know, you can know you have eternal life. You have been set free. But now each one of us is free to go. We're free to go and share the good news of Jesus with as many people as we can. In fact, we need to, we must I pray this morning that we will all go with that sense of mission and purpose. Sharing the good news however we can. And even more than that, Father, this morning, I pray that we as a church on that mission will call out to you. We'll call out to you to come back into our town, to come back into our state. Jesus, don't go. Come back into our country. Come back as we come before you, putting our pride aside because we can't do without you. We need you. Yes, Lord Jesus, come and heal us as only you can. We lay everything at your feet. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.